So, uh, if we're talking about life and biology, all living things are made of chemicals. And while you don't need a huge amount of chemistry to understand uh, biology, there's some pretty basic chemistry that you do need to know. So today we're going to talk about what chemicals are and what chemical bonds are and what different types of chemical bonds you might encounter in a biological setting. So um, basically there's two sorts of things that exist, matter and energy. And when you get into like advanced relativity and stuff like that, you find out that matter and energy are actually different manifestations of the same thing. But for our purposes, we're going to pretend that they're different, right? And chemicals are the matter part of it. Pretty much all matter, certainly that you're likely to encounter in a biological setting, is made out of chemicals. So what sorts of things are there? Well, so for instance... Birds. Birds definitely count as uh, uh, as being made out of chemicals, being made out of a bunch of different sorts of chemicals. Water. Water is a chemical as well. Water is a more simple chemical than birds. Water has only two chemical elements, hydrogen and oxygen, but as we will see later on, it is one of the most important chemical arrangements to biology and how biology works. Wood. Uh, wood's a very important biological chemical. Deceptively simple for all uh, of its uh, the many different things that you can do about it, wood is mostly made out of glucose, sugar. It's a polymer of glucose with an interesting chemical arrangement, and it's not just a polymer of glucose. There's more in wood than just cellulose, but its primary component is basically sugar. That, that tree... Or, well, a living tree's got a bunch of stuff going on. But, you know, that log that you're looking at, that dead log, that's mostly sugar. Um, and sugar is very definitely a chemical. Spiders. Also chemicals. Um, they're living things. They're mostly made out of water and organic chemicals, which we'll talk about in a little bit what an organic chemical is uh, in very complicated arrangements that allow them to do spidery things, but they're still primarily chemical in nature. The sun. The sun is, again, chemically speaking, very simple. It is primarily composed of two elements, hydrogen and helium. Um, the sun is, is undergoing uh, nuclear reactions all the time, chemical fusion, converting hydrogen into helium and releasing a lot of energy as it goes along. So the sun actually incorporates both of those elements that we talked about, chemicals and matter and energy. Um, but the sun is primarily a chemical phenomenon. So if matter is made out of chemicals, then what would we say matter is? Matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. Those are two things that all matter has. Like, it has to be a physical thing that occupies space, as opposed to light, which doesn't exactly occupy space. You can have two light particles that are both in the same place at the same time. Um, but matter... You can't have two atoms that are located in the same place at the same time. They would bump into each other, and one of them would knock the other one out. Uh, matter, for our purposes at least, is composed of chemical elements. A chemical element is a substance that cannot be broken down by non-nuclear means. Now, back in the day, uh, before, you know, Einstein and and nuclear fission and things like that, we would say that elements could not be broken down any further. But we eventually discovered that they could be, though I wouldn't recommend doing it in your home. It's a little messy. Um, 
but uh, an element is, well, if you look at the periodic table of elements, which we'll show you in uh, a little bit, um, those are all elements. They're all uniform. They're all made out of one type of atom. There are 92 naturally occurring elements on Earth. Um, there are some elements that do not naturally occur on Earth, but which can be made in a lab or in a nuclear reactor or in a synchrotron or something like that. Many of them don't last very long, which is probably why they aren't naturally found here. Um, but there are 92 naturally occurring elements. Uh, most of those elements are not particularly relevant to life. You're not going to find a whole lot of, you know, francium or einsteinium or uranium in a biological system. At least, one would hope not. Uh, there are 25 elements that are important to people, well, that are essential to living things, let us say. And uh, of those 25 elements that you really have to have if you're going to be alive, most of you is four of them. Uh, these four elements make up 96% of the weight of most cells in your body. And those four, these are the big four and you need to know them, are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen abbreviated O, C, H, and N. Now, by weight, this is uh, about the right order. Um, oxygen is abundant uh, both in the water. Remember that most of your body, most of your cellular mass, is made up of water. And water is what makes up most of the mass, or oxygen is what makes up most of the mass of water. Uh, there's actually twice as much hydrogen as there is oxygen, but hydrogen is really, 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 really light, whereas oxygen's about 16 times as heavy. So even though there's twice as many hydrogens, most of the mass of water is made from the oxygen. But you also find oxygen in a lot of the organic compounds that make up the non-water portion of your body as well. So it's pretty common. Um, it's also the heaviest of these four. So it makes sense that it would be top of our list. Uh, carbon is pretty abundant in your body. It's not found in water, but it's found in pretty much everything else. We'll be discussing the chemistry of carbon fairly extensively in future lectures. Um, but it's essential for the sort of complicated molecules that allow life to exist. Hydrogen is abundant and found everywhere. There's two hydrogens on every water molecule, and most of the organic molecules are what we call hydrocarbons, or partial hydrocarbons, meaning that they're mostly made out of carbon and hydrogen. So you find hydrogen just all over the place inside of your body. By number, hydrogen is clearly the most uh, uh, numerous thing to find uh, in your body. But like I said, it's very light. Nitrogen is certainly the least common of the three. It is found primarily in proteins. Now, proteins are the things that are going to be most abundant in your cells other than water. Um, uh, but mm, even then, it's not most, there's, there's many more hydro, or many more uh, uh, carbons in protein than there are nitrogens. There's probably more oxygens in most proteins than there is nitrogens. You're also going to find nitrogen a little bit in DNA and RNA and nucleic acids, but again, it's not going to be the primary component. So it's certainly the least abundant of the big four. Here you can see a sort of distribution of these things within your body. So like if we were looking at how much of your body is composed of each element. A good 65% of your body is oxygen. Now remember, most of that is water. Um, but a lot of it, you know, is, is also in the non-water portion as well. 
good 18.5% would be carbon. 9.5%, uh, 9.5% 9 .5, 9 .5 would be hydrogen, and 3.3% would be nitrogen. And so you can see right there, that's most of your body. Now you take a look at this guy's feet down here. Um, and uh, you see the feet are yellow. Um, those are uh, what I'm going to call the small seven. Right? So you got the big four, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. The small seven, these are found in measurable quantities. That means that there's enough of them that you can measure it in a body or in a cell. Um, but they're, they're at much lower levels than the big four. So the, the small seven, and you should also probably know these are going to be calcium. Calcium is actually the most abundant metal in your body. A lot of people don't know that calcium is a metal, but calcium is technically a metal, even though it's not found in its metallic form in your body. But it's the most abundant metal in the body because it's the primary component of your bones. Phosphorus, found mostly in the form of phosphate, uh, is another bone component. And phosphate is a very common ion to find inside of cells. And we'll talk a lot about the uses of phosphate later on. Potassium, uh, a very common ion to find in the body. When we talk about muscle and nerve cells, we will pay a lot of attention to potassium. Sulfur. Um, sulfur is found in, in proteins, um, but at a much, much lower level than even nitrogen is. So there's only a few protein components that contain sulfur, but you do have a lot of protein in your body. There are a few other things that use sulfur as well. Sodium. Sodium is found anywhere there's water in your body. It's often got sodium in it. Um, again, sodium is going to be really important when we talk about nerves and muscles. Um, it's also pretty important when we talk about blood and kidneys. And sodium is part of how your body moves water around. So it's really actually very important. Chlorine, uh, mostly found in the form of chloride, which is the ionic form. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but that chlorine is a counter ion to sodium and potassium. And magnesium. Um, which is also abundantly found, well, not abundantly, it's 0.1%, but is found inside cells at a, at a relatively reasonable number. Uh, past that, we have what are called the trace elements. These are things that your body needs. You have to have them to survive, but you don't need them at very high levels. In fact, it's actually pretty hard to measure how much of them you need. Um, they're, they're present at such low quantities other than in a few areas of your body that, um, they're basically just a whiff. Um, so you need these things, but you don't need much of them. And, um, uh, you should, you don't need to memorize all of these, but you should be familiar with what a trace element is. And, um, you know, you should probably be able to recognize at least a few of them, um, Boron, chromium, cobalt, copper, fluorine, iodine, and iron. Iodine and iron are probably ones that you should probably know where trace elements. Uh, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, silicon, tin, vanadium, and zinc. Those are the chemicals that your body must have to operate. So when we talk about these elements... Um, they're found in the form of atoms. Most of you probably know from previous classes what an atom is, but let's review that structure right now. Um, an atom has two parts to it. It has the nucleus. Nucleus means center. And the nucleus is where most of the mass of the atom is. It's where like 99.99% .99 of the mass of the atom is. And it's really, really small. And it's in the center, and it's made of two things. Protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which are neutral. The element 
that we're talking about, whether it's oxygen or nitrogen or potassium or whatever, is determined by the number of protons. So if you've got two protons, you're a helium. If you've got uh, eight protons, then uh, you're an oxygen. If you've got six protons, you're a carbon. That's what determines what element you are is the number of protons. Um, those are found in the center, and the electrons are found... We usually draw them as if they're, like, orbiting the nucleus. We don't actually have the evidence to say that they're orbiting in a circle. Um, how it's really described is that they exist within a cloud that surrounds the nucleus. Electrons are really, really tiny. Um, and they don't weigh very much, though they do weigh at least a little bit. Uh, but they have a negative charge. One electron has exactly the same amount of negative charge as a proton does of positive charge. They have one full charge. <laughs> Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. Um, the number of electrons in the cloud, is, is largely what determines the chemical properties of an atom, and whether it's an ion or not an ion, and, and what sort of bonds it's going to form. All of that is in the electrons. Um, as far as we're concerned, the nucleus has almost no interactions with anything else. The only time the nucleus has interactions is in nuclear, well, reactions in nuclear chemistry, and we're going to hope that there isn't any nuclear reactions going on inside of your body, because that could be bad. Um, so all of the chemistry that happens in your body is happening with electrons interacting with other electrons. The number of neutrons can vary. Um, there's rules for how they vary and whatnot, but you can have a few more or a few less and and still be the same element because the number of protons isn't changing, and those are called isotopes. Um, you can have the number of electrons change and still remain the same element, technically, but something does change. The charge changes. If you just change the number of neutrons, you haven't affected the charge since neutrons are neutral. Um, so the properties don't change very much. If you change out the number of electrons, you're either adding or removing charge. And when you do that, you can create what are called ionic bonds. So here's the fast and simple rule, is that these electrons are found orbiting the nucleus, well, in a cloud around the nucleus, and um, there's like different levels of clouds. You got your your inner cloud, and then your next cloud out, and then the next cloud out after that. And um, the inner cloud can only hold two electrons. Oops. The inner cloud can only hold two electrons. Uh, all of the other ones can hold up to eight. And atoms are happy when their outer cloud is full. Like, either it's either got eight, or if it's the first one, it's got two. That's what's going to make an atom happy. Uh, and, and not actually happy, because they don't have emotions, but stable. That's what's going to make it non-reactive and not want to change. So let's take two atoms here. This is a sodium atom. It has one electron in its outer shell. This is a chlorine atom. It has seven electrons in its outer shell. These are both very unhappy atoms, because they're really close to being happy, but they're not there. And it's like, it's if you're like nowhere near where you need to be, yeah, you can kind of accept that, right? But it's like, 
when you're right next to where you need to be, that's the most frustrating place to be in. Like when you're sitting at a, 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 a 69.5 in the class and you're like half a point away from getting a passing grade, and you go, oh, that sucks. If you were at like a 30, you'd probably go, yeah, I screwed up. I I don't have any chance of passing this. You're like half a point away. That's what's the most frustrating thing for you. That's how these atoms are feeling right now. They're both really, really frustrated because they're both really, really close to having a full outer shell. And that's obvious with the chlorine atom. You say, oh, but yeah, obviously it has seven. It needs eight. All it needs is one more. So it's, it's really close to the finishing line there. So that's understandable. You go, oh, what about the sodium? It's only got one. It's like seven away. Ah. Remember, there's two ways to get it out of a shell. You can either fill up your shell, like get enough electrons that your shell is now full, or you can give away electrons so that your outer shell is empty and an empty shell isn't there. The shell beneath it was already full. So there's a way for these atoms to become very happy. And it is that this sodium will give up an electron to the chlorine. Sodium now has a full outer shell, because it lost the one in its outer shell, and now it reverts. And chlorine now has a full outer shell. So both of these are very happy, very stable, very satisfied atoms. Uh, except they're not actually called atoms anymore, because atoms, by definition, have no charge. These are now called ions. Ions have a charge. This sodium has lost an electron. Electrons are negative. If you lose a negative, you become positive. This is a positive ion, which is what we call a cat ion. This chlorine has gained an electron. Electrons are negative. So it now has a negative charge. It is what we call an anion. These two prefixes, cat and an, are often used in chemistry and biology to describe like two opposite states. You'll see this over and over again. Like we'll talk about catabolism and anabolism, cations and anions, cathodes and anodes. Cat and an is, comes from, like, Latin or something like that, but it, it just means that they're kind of like opposites. They're two, two opposite things. This is a cation, and this is an anion. Let me write that here. Cat and an. So ions with opposite charges are going to be attracted to each other. Uh, what that means is that once these two things have exchanged ion or exchanged electrons, well, this is now positive, this is now negative, they're really close to each other, they're going to stick like magnets. Right? So this is now positive, this is negative, and they get stuck together. There's not an actual force, like a physical thing between them, but they're attracted to each other because positive things are attracted to negative things and vice versa. Uh, an important consideration with ions is that ions don't care what they're next to as long as it's of the opposite charge. So this chloride, ne negative ions are usually called ides, they're not always, but usually. So it's the name of the, like chloride, oxide, nitride, that sort of thing. Um, this negative ion, this anion, wants to be next to a positive ion, a cation. It's grabbed hold of this sodium here because the sodium was already right close by. Um, but you could have another positive ion that comes in and sits here and knocks this away. Uh, it, so it, it, they're, they're pretty, you know, uh, promiscuous. This anion 
doesn't care what positive ions it's next to, it just wants to be next to positive charges. This cation wants to be next to negative charges, it doesn't really care what negative charges they are. Ions are super important for life. Um, they maintain fluid balance, electrolyte balance. An electrolyte is actually just a fancy term for an ion um, because in water, ions conduct uh, electric charge. Pure water is actually an insulator. It doesn't conduct electricity at all, contrary to what you might see in the movies. Um, but water with ions in it conducts electricity very well. That's why they're called electrolytes. They're things that if you add them to water, it makes the water more electrically conductive. They also mediate pH balance. We'll talk about pH balance in a future lecture. Um, they're essential to nerve and muscle cells. We'll talk about this very extensively later on in the course. Um, they regulate the activity of enzymes. There are certain enzymes uh, within your body that have to do chemistry, and they just will not do that chemistry if they don't have the right ions around them. And uh, ions are also really useful ways of transporting things in and out of the cells. Ionic bonds are not the only way for elements to be bound together. Uh, in fact, the more common way, at least within your body, is through what is called a covalent bond. Covalent bond is a different strategy. So with ions, when you have two things that are like really, really close to getting to full shells, um, they, you know, one of them can like let go completely of an electron, the other one can take the electron completely. But what if you have two things that are like, neither of them are actually all that close to one side or the other? Like here we have two hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen uh, is the first atom, so its shell needs two to be full. Both of these have one. Well, so is it going to be easier for them to gain one or lose one? Mm, it's kind of 50-50. There's not a really big difference here. So another strategy that atoms can adopt to get a full shell is instead to share. And so these two hydrogen atoms are going to share their electrons. These electrons will now be orbiting both atoms. So this now has two electrons orbiting it, and this now has those same two electrons orbiting it. Uh, and that's what's called a covalent bond. It is a pair of shared electrons. A single bond is two shared electrons. If you have four shared electrons, then that is a double bond. Uh, the fact that these electrons are now orbiting both of these nuclei holds the nuclei together. This is different from ionic bonds in a few ways. First off, um, it's specific, right? These two electrons are shared between these two atoms. Another atom, like if it comes in, Let's say another hydrogen comes in. Well, it's not going to have a very easy time. There would actually have to be a chemical reaction um, that would break this bond and form a new bond uh, in order for it to displace this atom here. So, uh, and, and forming a new bond requires energy. So, for the most part, you know, it just can't come in and knock something else out very easily. It, it, it's This interaction is specifically between these two atoms. It's also directional. Ionic bonds are non-directional. They just got to be close to each other. I'm positive I got to have negative stuff near me. I don't care what side of me they're on. It would be best if they're kind of on all sides of me. But this covalent bond is specifically from here to here. So it has a specific direction to it. Um, it also, uh, it, it doesn't involve the creation of any charged molecules. So both of these, uh, or charged ions, I should say, uh, both of these are 
um, are uncharged, remain uncharged, and uh, at least mostly. We'll get into some exceptions to that later on. And uh, and and uh, are no no ions are made. Um, a compound is anything that has more than one type of atom. An ionic compound is a compound that's held together with ionic bonds. A covalent compound is called a molecule. Molecules have covalent bonds. Now, an important concept here. I'm going to start off by telling you a story. All right. So I've got a sister. Um, she's about five years younger than me. And when we were kids, sometimes mom would get us a toy. And she would say, all right, so I'm getting you this toy. This is for you two to share. And we both not. Yeah. But I'm like five years older, I'm bigger than she was. Do you really think that we shared it equally? No. I got the toy most of the time. She got to use the toy when I didn't want to play with it. So with atoms, it's not really all that different. Atoms don't always share equally. Some atoms are stronger than others. This strength, this ability to grab, this electro-grabbiness, the ability to grab the electrons and have them spend more time with you is called electronegativity, and this is an important concept that you need to grasp. All right. In general, electronegativity increases as you go to the right of the periodic table and up. Right. We don't usually consider the electronegativity of this last row because these are what are called the noble gases. They don't make covalent bonds, so it doesn't matter how much how electronegative they are, they don't share. But these guys here, these are called the halogens, they are very electronegative. That means that if they are in a sharing relationship, they're going to get the electron most of the time. Most of these guys are actually so electronegative that they don't easily participate in covalent bonds. Most of these guys are going to form ionic bonds. They're, you're either going to give them your electron or they're going to take it from you. But you get over here, and you get into some atoms that are, you know, especially these ones right here. You get into some atoms that are electronegative, but still capable of forming uh, covalent bonds. And so carbon, technically, right in the middle of the periodic table. We don't count these guys in the middle here, right? So this is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Carbon, boom, right there in the middle. Not very electronegative. Oxygen, over here in six, more electronegative. Nitrogen, electronegative, not as electronegative as oxygen, but more so than carbon. Sulfur, phosphorus, fairly electronegative. Not as much as oxygen and nitrogen, but still fairly electronegative. The more electronegative you are, the more time the electrons spent with you. That has a consequence. So here we have what is called a nonpolar covalent bond. This is a hydrogen, this is a hydrogen. They're the same atom, they have the same electronegativity, which is not very much. Um, but that means that they're the same strength, and so when they share electrons, they share evenly. The atom has an even dispersal of electric charge. This is what is called a polar covalent bond. Polar means that the two sides are different. It has 
poles. Poles are distinguishable ends. Basically, you know, we're polar, hopefully. We can all tell our heads from our butts, right? We got a head end, we got a butt end. We are polar things. You can tell one end from the other. This is nonpolar. You can't tell which end is which. This is polar. Why is it polar? Well, it's polar because this electron here and this electron down here are going to be more attracted to the stronger, more electronegative oxygen. So they spend more time with the oxygen. Well, the ox if they spend more time with the oxygen and they're negative, what charge do you think the oxygen end will have? The oxygen end becomes not fully negatively charged, not like an ion, because they do still spend some of their time with the hydrogen, but it becomes partially negative. This little squiggly thing here is a lowercase Greek delta, and it means partial in this case. So we say that this end is partially negative. It's got a little bit of negative charge. Not a full negative charge, but a little bit of negative charge. This end over here, since it doesn't get the electrons as much as it would like, it ends up with a partial positive charge. And so this is a polar bond. It has a negative end, and it has a positive end. That leads to some interesting stuff starting to happen. One of those things is what is called hydrogen bonds and dipole, dipole or polar interactions. All right? So this is going to be part of what holds substances together. So let's take a look at this thing here. All right? This is actually a molecule called acetone. You see that it's got a carbon here in the middle. It's got two carbons off to the sides, a single covalent bond to each. So that's a pair of shared electrons to each. And then each of these carbons has three hydrogens attached to it. Carbon has four electrons, so it needs to make four covalent bonds in order to get up to eight. Carbon special in that it forms four bonds. We'll talk about that in a little bit. This carbon in the middle here is also forming two bonds, what's called a double bond to this oxygen. Now, if you recall, oxygen is really electronegative. Carbon is not. So these electrons spend more time with the oxygen. The oxygen then becomes negative. The carbon then becomes positive. So if you have a bunch of acetone all together, the different molecules can interact with each other. Right? This has got a positive end and a negative end. This has got a positive end and a negative end. This negative end wants to be near this positive end. So they will line up so that the negatives and positives are close to each other. That is what is called a dipole-dipole interaction. And it will hold the molecules close together. This is why acetone, better known as nail polish remover, is a liquid at room temperature. It's because it has these dipole-dipole interactions holding the uh, uh, the molecule together, whereas propane, which also has three carbons, but is nonpolar, is a gas at room temperature. It doesn't have these forces holding it itself together, so it just floats all free. There's a special so sort of dipole-dipole interaction called a hydrogen bump. <laughs> now remember that hydrogen is just one proton and one electron. So that means that in this bond right here, that's a polar bond. This oxygen 
gets the electrons most of the time and becomes partially negative. This hydrogen doesn't get the electron most of the time and remain and becomes positive. But it doesn't have a whole bunch of other electrons that are orbiting it at the same time, like say these carbons do. Even though this carbon may have like two of its electrons being pulled away by this oxygen, it's still got four other electrons orbiting it. So it's still got some electrons. But with this hydrogen, when its electron isn't near it, it's got nothing left. It's just a patch of positive. That allows it to do something special, to form an especially strong polar interaction. So a hydrogen bond is a bond between a hydrogen that is in a, is in a polar covalent bond. So this is a polar covalent bond. This is a hydrogen in a polar covalent bond. And it is going to be a bond between that particular naked positive charge and the negative charge of a lone pair of electrons on something else that is involved in a polar covalent bond. This one with the hydrogen is what is said to be the hydrogen bond donor. The hydrogen bond donor has to have a hydrogen. This over here that it's bonding to is called the hydrogen bond acceptor. The hydrogen bond acceptor does not have to have a hydrogen. All it has to have is a polar covalent bond. So for instance, this water molecule, oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen, this water molecule could form a hydrogen bond with that acetone. The water would be donating the hydrogen bond. It has to have a hydrogen. The acetone can receive a hydrogen bond, but can acetone donate a hydrogen bond? No. The only polar covalent bond here is this one. And there's no hydrogens on it, so it can only receive, it can't donate. Hydrogen bonds are stronger than any other dipole-dipole or polar interaction. In biology, most hydrogen bonds are going to involve OH bonds or NH bonds. Those are both strong enough to donate a hydrogen bond. Uh, there are also other forces that can hold things together, right? So dipole-dipole interactions and uh, hydrogen bonds are the strongest of them. That's why acetone is a liquid, why alcohol is a liquid. Alcohol has that OH that can form um, hydrogen bonds. Water has two hydrogen bond forming things. That's why water is actually really hard to get to boil, um, which is why you use it as a thermal buffer in like your car, why you put water in your radiator. It's because water absorbs heat really, really well. It has all of these hydrogen bonds that you would have to break before it turns into a gas. It's actually really hard to boil water. Um, but there are other things out there that can hold molecules together. Um, these are what are called nonpolar interactions, and they can hold things together even if they don't have polar bonds. One of them is what's called the van der Waals force. The van der Waals force has to do with statistical variability. So this atom has four electrons around it, and it's got four protons on the inside. So it's neutral. It's got four positives, four negatives. Um doesn't have any polar bonds, might be bound to something, like it, it, could, it could even be bound to something else here with four positives and four negatives around it, but that would then be a nonpolar bond because they both have the same number of protons, so they're both going to be the same atom. 
Um, the, uh, uh, the electrons are orbiting randomly. For the most part, they're evenly distributed. But just due to random haphazard chance, at some point, if you take a snapshot, one instant in time, you might find a time when all four electrons are all on the same side. Just by sheer random chance. It's like if you got, you know, if, if you got four people bouncing around a room, at some point, they might all be on the same side of the room. It could happen. When that does happen, that means that this side is now negative. And this side is now positive. Well, this positive side is going to pull at the electrons of a nearby atom, pulling and making it more likely that those electrons will end up on that side of the molecule, and then it will have an induced dipole. These are what are called transient dipoles. Um, the molecule itself is not polar. The bond is not overall polar. But every so often, it just sort of like a polar event happens, and it lasts for like a micro instant, like uh, a, a, a one one millionth of a millisecond or something like that. Uh, and when that happens, it sort of pulls the atoms together. You might say, well, it's only like one one millionth of a second. That's true, but in any reasonable mass of the substance, you'll have billions upon billions upon billions of atoms. So some of them are going to be in this dipole state at any one time. Um, these van der Waals interactions are stronger the more electrons you have. The more electrons you have, the more likely you are to have an imbalance. So the bigger a molecule is, the more electrons it has, the more of these van der Waals interactions you can have. This is why something like propane or butane, which you would find in like, you know, a, a propane canister that you might use with your stove, something like that. That's a gas. Propane's only got three carbons. It's not very big. On the other hand, octane is gasoline. It's what you put in your car. You probably know that it's a liquid because you've put it in your car before. They're both nonpolar bonds, but that octane has eight carbons. So it's like two and a half times as large as the propane. It's big enough that these van der Waals interactions can actually keep it together in a liquid form. Not for very long. Like if you spill some gasoline on the ground, you'll note that it evaporates really, really quickly, right? Because it doesn't have much force holding it together, but it has enough to keep it liquid, at least for a little while. Uh, the other type of nonpolar interaction is called a hydrophobic interaction. This is really important to biology, but it, and I can't stress this enough, only happens if the substance is in water or another polar solvent. Because it's actually going to be the energy of the polar bonds that are forcing this hydrophobic interaction. So let's take a look here. All right. So here we have, this is some water floating around here. These little dots are water. And these two big things here, these are non-polar. Well, water can only form hydrogen bonds with polar things. And water wants to form as many hydrogen bonds as it possibly can. These ones that are right next to the nonpolar thing, they can't form as many hydrogen bonds as they would like to. They can form hydrogen bonds with stuff on this side of them, but they can't form hydrogen bonds with stuff on this side of them. So they don't want to be close to this nonpolar thing. It disturbs them. It's not something that they can bond with. It's like the weird guy in the room. People go up and try to talk to, and, and he just goes, eh, eh, eh. I was that weird guy in the room, by the way, when I was in high school. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that. So what happens? Well, if we take a look at, at this situation on the left, and we count up 
how many waters here are in this uncomfortable reaction of being next to something that is nonpolar. Well, we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. So here on the left, we have 32 water molecules that are in a non-ideal situation. They're uncomfortable. They're not forming as many bonds as they could. They want to form as many bonds as possible. How can they do so? Well, let's see what happens when you push these two nonpolar things together. Right? So the water molecules are going to push them together. These two nonpolar things, they aren't attracted to each other necessarily, but the water is pushing them together. Now let's see how many waters are non-ideal here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Well, twenty-two is less than thirty-two. So we've got ten more waters that are happy. And the waters want to maximize their happiness, so they will push these nonpolar things together in order to free up water to form more interactions. I, I kind of like to think of this as, as sort of similar to social dynamics in high school. Like, I was the nerdy kid, right? I didn't have a whole lot of social interactions. I played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, video games, and I read a lot, right? You put me in a group with a bunch of popular kids, well, what's going to happen? If I'm in the middle of their group, I'm disrupting their social interactions, right? If I just blunder into a group of the popular kids, they can't really talk to each other with me there. I'm breaking up their social interactions. They can't interact with me because I'm pretty antisocial. That makes them uncomfortable. I'm oblivious because I've always been oblivious, right? So what happens? Well, the... The non, the socially awkward kids, the geeks, all sort of get pushed into a little cluster together where they, you know, form gaming groups and stuff like that. Um, and uh, that frees up the social people to go ahead and interact with each other. Now, we wouldn't have necessarily found each other. Us, us socially awkward people would not necessarily have found each other and formed groups by ourselves because that's kind of part of being what socially awkward is. So you don't really form groups well. But you all get sort of pushed together because no one else wants to interact with you and you end up all in one big group, one cluster. Uh, and that allows all of the popular people to maximize their interactions with each other. And then, you know, we all get you know pushed together and we're kind of okay with that. Right? So that's what's called the hydrophobic force. In water, things which are nonpolar will tend to get pushed into a group. All right, so that does it for bonds, chemical bonds for us today. Um, next time, uh, we will take up looking at a little bit more of the chemistry of life.